Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of the Chainsaw Reacts Podcast, episode number 24. And today guys, we are covering three topics and those topics in order are number one, Ant-Man spoiler talk. The movie has been out for a week at this point, so I want to get into some spoilers, talk about the things I really liked about Ant-Man. So letting you guys know, fair warning, and I'll warn everybody again when we get to the topic, is it's spoilers and everything and all that kind of stuff. So if you have not seen Ant-Man, I highly recommend it and all that kind of stuff. So anyways, the second topic is going to be, will Fantastic Four suck? The reboot version. We are, we already know the first two films they tried live action were, were horrible, but will the new Fantastic for reboot film, Will It Suck? So we're going to get into that, kind of talk a little bit about what we've already seen and my thoughts. And of course, it's just my opinion, just because whatever I say in that segment is not, I'm not saying that, that will happen. I'm just saying these are my thoughts and all that kind of stuff. I just want to talk about how the public is uh, you know, taking everything and how I'm personally taking everything we've already seen from this movie. Anyways, and topic number three will be kind of like what I did with The Walking Dead, talking about Mad Men. That'll be the third topic, just basically just kind of rambling and talking about some of the the things I like about the series and all that kind of stuff where I am at this point. So there'll be some spoilers for Mad Men, the TV show, if you've not seen it up to a certain point. So anyways, let's get into the first topic, which is Ant-Man spoiler talk. So first things first, I want to say this. I really enjoyed the film. I thought Ant-Man was a fantastic film. I thought it was really well put together. Paul Rudd is an amazing character uh, amazing actor essentially his character was really awesome I, I really liked Scott Lang as the character I really liked it when he had the Ant-Man suit on and I really liked the fact that when he was when he was Ant-Man you believed he was Ant-Man you know he wasn't trying to play too seriously and that was kind of like my thoughts and all this stuff when I was reacting to trailers and stuff like that for the movie before it came out and I was saying in my reaction videos to those different trailers saying they couldn't really play this character too too seriously because people would take it as a joke. So I like the fact that there was a, there was a lot of humor from Scott Lang, uh, Paul Rudd's character. There was some humor from Michael Douglas, uh, Hank Pym's character. There was some humor from Michael Pena and T.I. and I forget the other guy's name who is also in the film as well as one of the people that Paul Rudd hangs out with, his kind of crew essentially in the film. So there's a lot of humor in this movie, but at the same time, there is some drama. There is some action that is really, really cool. And the scenes where he is actually shrinked down to Ant-Man size, and he is the actual Ant-Man when he's small, are really awesomely shot. They are beautifully shot, and it's just something that, you know, I think it really worked out, and it really made the movie feel different than other Marvel Cinematic Universe films because he's going smaller. We're seeing a whole different perspective. And just because, you know... It's he's a different superhero, you know that, that that's not the only difference. You know, there's an actual different perspective when he's smaller and all that kind of stuff. So it's really really cool to see that. So let's get into some spoilers that I really loved about this movie to kind of help it tie into the M M MCU without going too overboard. So the first thing that really stood out to me that I really liked about this movie is that it set up the Hank Pym character really well in the cinematic universe right off the bat. The first scene you see is actually. In 1989, it was set in 1989, it's in S.H.I.E.L.D., and you see Howard Stark, a.k.a. Tony Stark's father, and an older Agent Carter, which is really awesome. Agent Carter is there for a small scene. You see Howard Stark, and then walks in Hank Pym, a.k.a. Michael Douglas. Of course, they had to de-age his face. He looks like he, he looks like he did back in like late 80s. It's really, really cool to see that. It looks like, wow, they filmed this back in the 80s for this movie to be put into it, but they did really well with the uh, d digitization of his face to make him look younger, so it was a cool scene to kind of see how he knows Howard Stark, he knows Agent Carter, and he basically quit S.H.I.E.L.D. in this scene because S.H.I.E.L.D. found out about his Ant-Man formula that he uses for his suit to make him go smaller, and they wanted to weaponize it, and that's why Hank Pym left S.H.I.E.L.D. and all this kind of stuff, so it was a really cool way to show right off the bat, the very beginning opening scene, Hank Pym is associated with the MCU in a big way. He's, in, he's He was working for S.H.I.E.L.D., he knew Tony Stark's father, he knew Agent Carter, and you know that's how it kind of starts off, and so I really enjoyed that. Another cool tie-in that I think was really, really awesome is that we kind of got a little bit of a glimpse about what we're going to see next year. So Civil War. What was really awesome is there was one particular part in the movie where they had to go get a device that they were going to use 
to steal the yellow jacket suit that was going to be uh, basically unveiled and showed off and potentially, and it was going to be sold to Hydra members that we get to see within the film. And they needed to get this machine, and it was an old building, and then when, they, when they're when they sent to go, when uh, Paul Rudd, a.k.a. Ant-Man, is, is sent to go get this machine, he pops up to the brand new Avenger headquarters that we get to see at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron, that building... He shows up, and then Falcon shows up, which they really held off Falcon in the movie for a long time. Like, literally, I think it was a week before the movie came out when it was officially revealed that, uh, that, um, excuse me, that, uh, that Falcon is in the movie. And it was really, really cool to see how they had an Avenger, but it wasn't too big of an Avenger because then it, it would have overshadowed, shadowed at that point the Ant-Man movie. Like, if they would have had Iron Man, Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr. show up for a scene instead of Falcon, it would have completely, he would have, it would have been Iron Man's movie at that point. You know, everyone would be like, oh, yeah, well, but Iron Man's here. You know, if it was Captain America, he shows up in the movie himself, like he shows up and meets Ant-Man, then there you go. Everyone's loving Captain America now. So they had to find an Avenger that wasn't going to go too overboard. So they found the Falcon. And what I meant earlier about how they were a little bit of teasing uh, to what we're going to see next year is Civil War because Ant-Man and Falcon actually fight each other. And then, of course, you know, Ant-Man's trying to play it off. Paul Rudd, you know, he's trying to play it off. But essentially, they, they there's a little bit of fighting, and it's pretty cool to see that. But then, um, you know, they continue on with the story. So that was really cool to tie in that. Um Another cool tie-in, which it really isn't a tie-in to the MCU per se, um, is that the first post credit scene is actually showing off that the Wasp suit is going to be finished and given to Hank Pym's daughter, and she's going to become the Wasp, uh, we assume, in the MCU later down the road in Phase 3. And then the second post credit scene, we get to see Captain America and Falcon, and they both have found Bucky, a.k.a. the Winter Soldier, and the scene is very, very small. Uh, small Ant-Man, ha, huh? joke, and then it continues on, and then the scene ends, so it's really, really cool to see that they, they actually show the second post credit scene with Bucky, uh, Winter Soldier, and, and Captain America, and Falcon are from Civil War, it's from a daily shoot from them filming Civil War, so that was really, really cool there, but anyways, let's get to the actual Ant-Man movie itself, instead of all the MCU tie-ins, but my main focus at that section, what I was talking about, was that they found ways to beautifully tie Ant-Man into the MCU without doing it overboard. They made a couple of jokes about the Avengers and all that kind of stuff and, you know, whatever, because he's like, uh, he's like, the first thing I think we need to do is call the Avengers. That's what Paul Rudd says to uh, Hank Pym. Scott Lang says to Hank Pym, the character, and then that's where Hank Pym goes off about how he doesn't like the Avengers and all this kind of stuff. But they found a beautiful way to tie it into the MCU without making it too overboard because they could have easily had Robert Downey Jr. show up for a, a two-minute cameo, and they could have had you know Captain America, Chris Evans show up for a five-minute cameo. They could have had Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson show up for a, a you know a t like a a scene or something, and they could have easily went way overboard and made this more of a kind of like, hey, this is a Black Widow, Iron Man, Captain America, Avenger film, and plus Ant Man. So they found a really cool way to make this Ant Man character likable. You really like Scott Lang's character. And I, I really like the fight at the end between Yellow Jacket and Ant-Man. You know, I think that Darren Cross, who is the villain of this movie, who's played by Corey Stoll, was a very cool uh, villain. He was not a villain like we're usually used to. Like now, there are people have made references to how he's, it's kind of similar to previous MCU films. But what I really like about Darren Cross, the character, not him in the Yellow Jacket suit, is that his whole thing was he was trying to please Hank Pym because Darren Cross was brought on to be Hank Pym's protege and he was supposed to be, you know, helping and he he's supposed to be basically taking over. He he was already at this point the leader and the head of uh, Pym Enterprises, you know, basically Hank Pym's place and Hank Pym, I guess, retired and now Darren Cross is taking over and Darren Cross wants to turn it into Cross Industries and all this kind of stuff and he developed the yellow jacket suit. Now really what I really liked about this plot point they were about to say is that it's not only one suit. Darren Cross found out a way to create the Ant-Man formula. He just had to perfect it and able to shrink people in the suit down to the Ant-Man size level and he was going to make an army just like what uh, Shield was trying to do was weaponizing it. And Darren Cross found out the way to make it a yellow jacket and now make it, you know, basically an army of people, not just one yellow jacket. He wanted an army of yellow jackets. And he was going to sell the formula to Hydra, which is, I think, was a really awesome plot point because Hydra is still very well active, even though, you know, they, uh, the Avengers take out a major base. 
in the opening of Avengers Age of Ultron. However, Hydra is still active, and that's really a thing that we got to keep up with. We got to make sure that these Hydra people are being taken down. So that was a really cool plot point to see that it's not just one Yellow Jacket, but it's a, a, an army of them. And when Darren Cross is actually in the suit as Yellow Jacket and he's fighting Ant Man, it's very, very awesome to see that both shrink. They're both fighting each other. They're both beating the crap out of each other. And then what really takes it over the edge because it's it's not like a humongous subplot. But Scott Lang wants to better himself for his daughter because he doesn't have custody of her. He's divorced. Uh, of course, the wife, <laughs> his ex-wife, is, uh, I, I don't know if she's married or dating a new a, a new guy. And, of course, the new guy is a cop. And, of course, Scott Lang's a, a, a you know, criminal in a sense where he's done some bad stuff. So they don't like each other very well. And... Uh, what really pushed it over the edge, I think, is that when they were, they, they, they made it very subtle about his daughter, Scott Lang's daughter, and how he wants to do better, and all this kind of stuff, and then, what really pushes us over the edge is that Yellow Jacket shows up at, uh, his daughter's house, where he, of course, does not live, and Yellow Jacket shows up to basically, I think he wants to kill Scott Lang's daughter, he wants to kill Ant-Man's da daughter, and it's very, very crucial to the point of the story where you care enough about Ant-Man, you care enough about his daughter for this to be a really pushing point because if they really if they push too much of the daughter angle, let's say hypothetically they push too much of the daughter angle in the movie and there wasn't enough learning about the Ant-Man character and all this kind of stuff, it's more about okay, Scott Lang and his daughter, then when it got to this point it was just like, okay, we get it, you were knocking it over the head that at some point Yellow Jacket would show up to affect his daughter and try and try to hurt her or anything like that. But they did it just enough to where you care about how he wants to, you know, change his life and everything and how to better himself for his daughter without them banging it over the head. So when it got to the point where Yellow Jacket shows up, Darren Cross shows up as Yellow Jacket at her house and is potentially waiting for Ant-Man to show up to kill her, essentially, and possibly kill him as well, his plans, then it really pushed it more home that this is a very crucial and, you know, a very heavy moment in the movie and it really was to me personally because I really got in, involved with this character I thought I, I, I didn't think that Ant-Man would bomb I thought that it would be a good film like a sleeper hit kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy where people are like wow this is really, really good and people keep going back to see it again and again and again and taking more of their friends and I really enjoy the fact that it's one of those movies because I literally I want to go see it again I just not have the chance to do it at, the, at this point but I will I plan on seeing it again because it was definitely a fun ride I feel like that Ant-Man did a lot of great things right. There, It's not an action movie. If you have not seen it, then obviously you should not be listening to this part of the movie. But what I really took away from it is that don't look at Ant-Man as an action movie. Because some people who watch the movie are kind of like, oh, you know, I wish it was something more. Ant-Man is not an action movie. There is some action in it. There is some fighting. There is, of course, some of those moments. Of course. It's, it's a Marvel Cinematic Universe film. It happens. However, Ant-Man is more of a character dramatic story to where you really they really show you the good side of Scott Lang the bad side of Scott Lang with his criminal past and everything like that and then his heroic side where he becomes the ant man as Michael Douglas says Hank Pym says to Scott Lang I want you to become the ant man and he he, he does and you really root for this guy and I really enjoy the plots they really pushed for this uh for this movie I really enjoy what they really did uh, for this movie because obviously this could have been just another action film this could have been just another film with the same generic stuff and you could say there's some generic stuff within it but there was some really cool ways to kind of make it interesting now what I really liked as well I, I'm probably going to mispronounce it but there's a thing where he go where Ant-Man goes smaller than he should in order to take out Yellow Jacket and defeat him in the end of the movie and he goes basically micro sub something like that it's it's said in the film a couple different times and it's basically the zone where you, you you keep shrinking and you'll never be able to get out of it essentially and that was basically a big plot point about Hank Pym's wife aka you know um you know, the, the mother of the daughter, I forget her name, let me look at the name of her real quick, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Hope Van Dyne, um, and her mother was the original Wasp, and she went sub, you know, micro sub whatever, and where she sh shrinked uh, more than she should, and she never got out of it because she, was ke she keeps shrinking, and there's no way to get out of it, there's no way to kind of build yourself up, I don't know why, but that's the way it's designed, and unfortunately... 
for uh, Scott Lang's sake, he has to in order to defeat the Wasp. He can't get into his suit, so he goes into that extra small level where he just realistically has ne- no one has ever came out of, and he defeats the Wasp. He, did, he does all that kind of stuff, and he uses these uh, little devices uh, that Hank Pym actually created to make things smaller or bigger, and he put the thing that makes things bigger in the suit and presses the button and is able to get out of the realm. And when they go into that realm, it's bizarre. It's creepy. There's a lot of, you know, weird subliminal stuff going on. Just a lot of crazy shapes and colors. And it's just weird imagery. It's really, really trippy, but it was definitely an awesome thing to kind of show a different side of the MCU. You could introduce to a new world essentially. Cause you're, it's, it's just a mic. It's just so micro compared to the actual world. It's just so bizarre. And from what I've heard in the comics, the world that Ant-Man went into that basically where no one can get out of where he actually does is an actual world within itself where there's actual characters and stuff going on in a micro level like that. So maybe they'll explore that maybe some more down the road in an Ant-Man sequel. Who knows? But for what it is, Ant-Man is a great film. I really enjoyed the film. A lot of great humor, a lot of great dramatic stuff. And I really enjoyed how they tied it with the tied into the MCU without going overboard with it. So that's really, really good there. So let me take a sip of the drink and we'll get into the second topic, guys. Okay, so wasted got two seconds there. Second topic is Will Fantastic Four suck the reboot? Now, first things first I want to say is, of course, this is my opinion. This is just my thoughts on about this stuff. My thoughts about the trailers, the pictures, and all this kind of stuff we've heard about the film so far. I have not seen the film. I'm just basing it off of my thoughts and what my opinions are about what I've seen that they've released so far. What the public has been saying, a lot of the public, what the majority have been saying, and we'll go from there. So first things first, to the public. Uh, the public, the majority, not everybody, I'm not generalizing saying everybody's thinking this, but the majority of people that hear anything new or see anything new, trailer, picture, whatever, description, something about this film, a poster, whatever, they're I'm like going, ugh, gross, ugh, oh my god, why are they doing this, this is so bad, that's, that's what I hear in my head when these people are talking. And I really don't understand why, per se, is it because the fact that Johnny Storm is African American? Is it because you don't like the new costumes? Is it because you don't like the new cast? Is it because you don't like the director? Is it because you don't want it to be dark? What did you expect, people? Days of Future Past, X-Men in 2014, was a very dark film. There was some humor. There was some fun moments. There was some, you know, light moments compared to all the darkness and everything. But what did you expect? Fox is going in this direction. Now, Deadpool that comes out in 2016 is going to be all about the comedy and everything else. But from what Fox is trying to do, they're trying to go a more dramatic route with their characters because it works so well for X-Men Days of Future Past. It's worked so well so far. They want to go in that direction because if you really think about it, before we continue on here, the Fantastic Four original two crappy comic booky f- films. Now, just because they were comic booky, they tried to be, doesn't mean that it, you know that that it should have been good or anything, or that's a bad thing. But what I'm saying is that they tried too much, and they 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 went too comedic with it. They went too you know uh, too far with it, and people took that a very bad way and that's a very light and funny and trying to make jokes and they're corny and all this kind of stuff and it didn't work so in order for them to in order for them to switch it up because imagine if they would have did a reboot if they, if they were still doing a reboot and it was just like the first two then you would just say they didn't do anything different that they're doing the same thing so they're still would be complaining but now that they've done stuff different they changed the origins of some of the things some of the characters some of the stuff about the fantastic four people are against it and here's my thing that I have to say to most of the people that are critiquing and attacking the footage, the posters, the pictures, everything we're, get, we're seeing about this movie. You haven't seen the movie yet. Yes, yeah, sure, fine. You, could, you, you, you don't like the cast. You don't like some of the people casted. Sure, you don't like the costume. Sure, you don't like how the thing looks. Sure, you don't like how Doctor Doom looks. Sure, you don't like the fact that they've changed some origins and stuff. Sure, you don't like the fact that some characters you know, are, are, are named differently or going in different directions or, you know, whatever. Sure. But at the end of the day, you have not seen the movie. So why are we prejudging? Unfortunately, we've all, we all prejudge. I can't sit here and say, you know, everyone prejudges except me. I prejudge as well. But 
on movies and stuff like this, I try my best not to. Because look what happened when we all thought that, you know, them casting a new cast, like the first X-Men First Class, which was 2011, a brand new cast in the 60s, younger cast members, and they were going to replace the original X-Men. Everyone thought at that time, and most people were going like, why are they doing that? I mean, it's it, it's interesting, but why would they do that? And then it turned to be very successful, and they combined both casts for X-Men Days of Future Past. So there's that. And then you look at the fact that when Heath Ledger was casted as the Joker, everyone went like, what? Heath Ledger's going to be the Dark Knight as the Joker? Huh? Oh my God, that's a horrible decision. Back in 1988, when it was, it was announced that Michael Keaton was going to be playing Batman in 1989's Batman, Tim Burton. Everyone went, Michael Keaton, the comedian, is going to be Batman? What? And then look what happened there. Everyone loved it. So, just because it initially sounds bad, it initially, it might look bad, but in context, we don't know for sure. This film might be fantastic. A <laughs> pun. But what if it is? Are these people still going to complain and say, I knew it was going to be good. You know people are going to be like that. For me... I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful. I think this film will be a great film. Why? Because I have high hopes for anything that look that looks int intriguing to me. They they're doing different stuff. They're not trying to follow the formula that failed on the first two films. What I like about this is that Fox and even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the DC Cinematic Universe, every studio that does comic book movies do things different than the comic books. Sure, some studios might take more liberties and change more things than others, but at the end of the day, things are always changed within these within these films. X-Men Days of Future Past was or was not even close to what the original story was in the comic book version. Yeah, sure, the concept of the Sentinels killing all the mutants is there, but there's a lot of different characters, and there's characters not used from the comic books in the film. And then uh, Kitty Pryde doesn't go back in time. It was Hugh Jackman's Wolverine that went back in time in the 70s. Okay, so where's all the complaining about that? I don't hear any complaining that they changed that. I don't hear any complaining that, you know, with the... Um, with the Winter Soldier, Captain America, they changed some stuff in that film as well that's not in the comic books. They changed some stuff for the movie. Where is the complaining about that? Exactly. So at the end of the day, we have to understand that these studios are taking risk. They're taking chances because if they did exactly what the, the source material the comic books was doing, then everyone would go, wow, they're not even doing anything different. So if the Fantastic Four reboot was exactly like the first two films was, and they look kind of similar to the, uh, you know, the, they're a younger cast, but the, the, it's the same younger cast, but they look exactly and kind of familiar to the, um, to the original two Fantastic Four films, and they're not doing anything different, it's the exact same, everyone would complain the same way, except instead of them saying they're changing everything to, guys, they're not doing anything different, they're doing the same stuff, what's going on, Fox has no creative ideas, they're just copy and pasting from the comic books, oh, Oh my god. So, you can't please everybody. That's the thing we're going to get to at this point. But, at what point do we just go, stop. Stop. Stop prejudging stuff. You have seen clips. You have seen trailers. You've seen TV spots. You've seen posters. You've seen pictures. You've seen the, the cast talk about the stuff in interviews and panels and everything. But guess what you have not seen? The film! You haven't even seen the movie yet. Seeing these trailers, seeing everything out of context and not within the story as a whole when it's co cohesively going through from the start to finish in the movie, you're left with a big thing. No context. You don't know why the thing's doing that. You don't know why Invisible Woman's doing that. You don't know why the Human Torch is doing that. You don't know why Mr. Fantastic is doing that. So, until we see the movie... We shouldn't prejudge, but unfortunately, that's this is what this is what happens. Unfortunately, in the world as we live in today, we prejudge everything. We just go off and say, "Yeah, yeah, okay, well, I don't like the look of it. I don't care. I'm not. I'm not even going to wait till the movie comes out. I'm just going to instantly hate everything about this." And that's just disgusting to me, honestly. It's just disgusting because we we will just prejudge anything before we even see it, before we even see the actual product. So. I'm just I'm just frustrated because I personally do think this film will be good because I feel like that it has potential to do something more. You know, there's been an actual uh, a story that came out yesterday that Brian Singer, who directed X Men, X Men Two, um, uh, I forget wait was there like a subtitle of that? Oh, anyways, 
X Men, uh, yeah, X Men Two, X Men United. Yes, I, I was trying to think of her subtitle. I remember now. He directed, he directed X Men, X Men, X Men Two, X Men Days Future Past, and now he's directing X Men Apocalypse. And he has stated that the Fantastic Four reboots, the Fantastic Four and the sequel, if those do well, supposedly there's probably going to be an X Men Fantastic Four crossover. If that happens. I think it will be pretty interesting to see that. But a lot of people, of course, instantly went, Oh my god, why would they do that? Oh, it's just, mm. It's just so annoying because people just say, Oh, well, Fantastic Four reboot. It's going to suck because the tra I don't like the trailer. Okay, so if you want to prejudge a film, a two-hour, maybe long, maybe a little bit shorter, maybe a little bit longer movie, based on a two-and-a-half-minute trailer, all right, go ahead. That's your own issue. That's not mine. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get involved with that nonsense. Um, but for me, you know, I think Fantastic Four, the reboot, will do good. I think it will get great reviews. Uh, some people will still not like it. I get it. But I have high hopes. I have high hopes this movie will do a lot of good things. And I can't wait I can't wait to honestly see it. So there is that. Let me take a sip of the drink and we'll get into the final topic. And we'll go and we'll be done. Okay. Third and final topic, which we'll be covering kind of going over the spectrum here, because we're, we're not gonna be following season by season. Kind of like what I did with Walking Dead, which is Mad Men up to season four. I've started season five. I think I finished two episodes of season five. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know so far in season four of Mad Men and go from there. So there will be some spoilers from the first four seasons. So anyways, I'm going to kind of ramble like I did with Walking Dead because that's, that's how I do it best. If I had a planned out thing and all this kind of stuff, it would it would feel planned and everything. And I kind of like it being just kind of organic and just kind of going with it. Um First things first, John Hamm, a.k.a. Donald Draper, the main character, is a phenomenal character. I really enjoy his character. I really thought at first that his character was good, but I, I just there was just something that I was just like, ah, you know, I like, I like his character. I like his style. I like his personality. I like everything that he's doing. There's just something not really clicking that I wish, I wish there was something more to his character, and then they really introduce a really cool plot point, which is a huge spoiler in the show, and I'm about to say it right now, so if you, like I said, if you've not seen Mad Men up to season four, this is going to ruin it if you plan on watching it, so stop now, stop now, here's the spoiler, he's not Donald Draper, he is Dick Whitman, and he was, uh, I think he was stationed somewhere, and he was with a uh, another army guy who was named Donald Draper, Don Draper, and Don Draper, it was an accident, Don Draper was killed, and Dick Whitman, who is actually John Hamm's Don Draper in the show, Dick Whitman uh, was actually mistaken as Don Draper, and Dick Whitman was pronounced dead, even though Don Draper actually died. So Dick Whitman, a.k.a. Don Draper on the show, as you see it, as John Hamm. John Hamm now has become Don Draper and continues on being Don Draper in the show instead of Dick Whitman. He gets rid of his old name. And you learn a lot about his backstory as a kid. You learn a lot about his character on that kind of level to where you kind of see how he grew up in a really poor family, a really messed up family, and then how he's become, become a very successful person as under a different name. And that's what I really enjoyed about his character. And what I really enjoy about a lot of characters on Mad Men so far on the show up to season four because... It's not just a one-dimensional thing for each character. They really give you a lot of in-depth with a lot of these different characters. Pete Campbell, who is a not a not you might consider a main cast member, but I would say kind of a reoccurring where he shows up in every episode, but he's not in every single scene. He's not as important. Even him, who he has come to the show, he's been through a lot of you know things throughout the show. You know, you find out his wife and him and his wife are trying to have a baby. They finally have a kid and everything like that. But you really learn about more about his character than you thought you would have. You would just think you would only see him at the workplace with uh, Don Draper, the main character. But other than that, you wouldn't see him go home. You wouldn't see him in, you know talking to his wife one on one. There's no one else in the room, no other characters, just them two. You would just not expect that on this type of show. You would expect a lot more. Focusing on Don Draper, focusing on other main characters of the show, yet they really go out of their way to kind of show you different angles of different characters. Peggy, for example, 
who is uh, one of the main female leads, who actually works with Don Draper now, who was actually started off as a secretary, and now she's uh, working as one of the people uh, in the ads, essentially, where she comes up with ideas, pitching ideas to companies and everything like that to run ads on TV and paper. Like, like minded, this is set back in the 60s, so, you know, it's a different time back then. And Peggy is a very interesting character, because at first, I didn't I didn't like her character at all. I didn't like Peggy. You know, Peggy starts off very bland. I'm kind of like, eh. She's kind of like every other female character on the show so far when it starts out. She's, there's just not really a lot to her. They slowly start introducing her to different characters, showing her personality, showing her different sides of her. And you really get a sense of that her character is not what it all seems to be. She she kind of keeps stuff to herself. Then she starts being a little more outspoken. Then she starts putting herself out there a little more. And then things get more interesting with her character. So I like that because they really show the differences and the, the changes these characters go through. Because this show could easily just go down the route of, okay, this is what this character is like. This is Don Draper. This is Peggy. Okay, this is Joanne. Okay, this is, um, this is everybody. This is Pete Campbell. This is all these characters. This is their setup. And then this is how they're going to be for the entirety of the series. They're, they're not going to change. They're not really going to go. They're going to go through some stuff, but they're not going to go through too much. They really go in depth with what these characters have to deal with. And one big thing that really I felt was a very hard hitting and a very realistic and real scene was when Don Draper, a, uh, Don Draper's ex-wife now at this point, finds out that he is not who he says he is. And the scene involving him and now his ex-wife on the show. It's just very uh, Betty. I believe her name's Betty. Uh, I'm probably blanking because I've. It's been a couple of days since I've seen the show because you know I've been trying to watch other stuff as well. Anyway, so when she finds out about that he's not Don Draper, he is Dick Whitman pretending to be Don Draper essentially from the uh, incident overseas that happened a couple uh, years, years and years and years ago at this point in the show. Um, to see how she just felt betrayed. She felt that she didn't know him because he's not Don Draper. He's Dick Whitman. And she's thinking that his name's Don Draper and this is blah, blah, blah. And he's playing, a, he's not playing a character. He's just play, he's just using a fake name. But yet to her, it's like a huge betrayal. And to see this scene unfold where it's just like brutal. And then after a couple more episodes, she wants a divorce and she's done. She's done. She wants him out of the house, everything else. And she remarries pretty quick in the show. And at the end of season four, which we're talking about up to season four at this point, Don Draper just decides I'm going to marry this girl, Megan, who's 25 years old. I'm about to be 40. I'm going to marry my secretary from the show. And he just does. And I'm like, all right, well that just happened, I guess. And, uh, you know, so there's that. So, um, also one more thing I really did like about the show is that th the setting it's in, it's in the 60s, of course, but it's such a different time back then, the way they're showing it, because every single time there's a problem, an issue, get a drink. Hey, a client doesn't like your stuff, get a drink. You're having a good day at work, everything went great, something great happened, uh, a you know, new business for uh, for the agency, get a drink. It's just, everything, just get a drink, and they're always they're smoking in people's offices. They're just basically in a whole different world compared to what we live in now. And it's just really awesome to kind of see this period piece set in that time and to kind of see how things were different compared to what it is now in 2015. So I'm going to give them big props because... No, there's no point in the show so far, at least up to season five from where I am at, but only talking about season four, there's no point in the show where I question, I don't believe this is, this is, this was filmed or this was shot in a room that was built for this, this time period. I, nothing felt out of place. There wasn't a point where I thought, well, that doesn't look kind of sixties ish. They really have a great way to kind of make, to make this, the surrounding areas, the buildings, the, the way they dress, the way they talk. And the way they acted, 60s-ish, to where it just it just it feels realistic and, and authentic. So that's really really awesome uh, for that. So that's kind of my ramble about Mad Men. I know I kind of rambled and went off in all different directions, but I mean it's a fantastic dramatic show. If you have not seen it, which I don't know why you're listening to the segment, but you know I like to say this anyways, is it's a fantastic series. Get into it if you want to. If you're intrigued, if you've not seen the show and you're listening to this part for some reason. Definitely give it a shot. But anyways, guys, that is the end of the podcast. Thank you guys for listening. You know, um, I love doing these podcasts each week, and I'm glad that some people listen to it. I'm en I enjoy doing it. I'm going to continue to do it and all that good stuff. So thank you guys for listening to episode number 24. Peace out.